A man meets a stranger at a cafe and invites him home. You won't believe what happens next. And then we've all heard of the story about the Dyatlov Pass, where nine hikers were struck down by an unknown compelling force. But did you know, 30 years later, it happens again? And this time, there was a survivor. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. We got a lot of stuff to cover, so let's go ahead and hop right into this first off. Let's give a shout out to one of our legacy Patreon supporters, C. Knowles. C. Knowles, thank you so much for continuing to support the show. You're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. Whatever vehicle we take, you're in charge of. You can't support the Patreon, that's fine too. Just help get the word out about that show. Really, really helps the show grow. So C. Knowles, let's go ahead and hop in the Jason jet. We're going to take a fast journey to Brussels, Belgium. C. Knowles got a little helmet on, taking off. None of us have helmets on, we're bumping our heads. Ah! By the time we get to Brussels, Belgium, C is doing loop-de-loops, so we're extra damaged. By the time we get to Brussels, Belgium, we're a little woozy from the flight, but we're okay. Because we're back in the year 1976, and nothing bad happens in the year 1976. My birthday was 1976. I actually turned 44 on October 4th. What'll that be, six days after this episode comes out? So, yay me! I'm just clapping. (laughs) Everyone's just kind of sitting there. I'm just clapping to myself in the middle of Brussels, Belgium. Okay, let's do the story. It's 1976, it's Brussels, Belgium. It's a starry little night. Little stars twinkling up in the sky. There's a man who only goes by the initials VVK. Now, I'm sure he has a real name in real life. I don't think he's like, hello, my name's VVK. So we'll call him Vincent. Vincent Von Crump. Vincent is walking through the streets of Brussels, Belgium. His town, he lives here. He's not a visitor. He knows the place very well. He actually goes to this cafe several nights a week to have a nice, refreshing beer. But one night in the year 1976, he's sitting down with his lager, drinking it, and he sees a stunning man sitting in the bar. Now, this man, Vincent, is happily married. He has a wife, a little daughter. He's not into dudes. But there's something about this guy that is so striking. He's handsome. He's tall, with blonde hair, piercing blue eyes, just sitting in the cafe with this glass of water, taking little sips of it. Something compels Vincent to get up and walk over and start talking to this dude. And he walks over and he sits down and he's like, hey, my name's VVK, but you can call me Vincent. I couldn't help but notice how attractive you were. I don't know if he actually said that, but he did sit down and he starts talking to the guy. And he is, wants to know about this guy. What's going on? And this dude goes, well, you know, I'm new in town. I've never really been to Brussels, Belgium before. And Vincent's like, oh, okay. pretty neat town, isn't it? He's like, I don't know what to do in Belgium, the man says. I don't know what there is to do around town. Vincent's kind of talking about the sights, everything that goes on in the town of Brussels. I don't, I don't know either. <laughs> I know you guys are like, what does happen in the city of Brussels? I don't know. There's got buildings. The sun goes up, goes down. People go to bed. I'm sure it's like a normal town. The man also looks at Vincent and goes, you know, between you and me, I can't even pay for this water. I don't have enough money to pay for this water. Now, I do know this apparently about Brussels. (laughs) They make you pay for water. I don't know if they do that nowadays, but in 1976, water wasn't free. It doesn't grow on trees. What do you think? It comes out of clouds or something? I don't have enough money to buy this water. I ordered this water. I'm in a town I've never been into. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pay for this water. And, he tells Vincent, I'm actually an extraterrestrial. Now, Vincent is like, okay, this is pretty dope, right? Sure, I was a little confused about my own sexuality when I felt myself drawn to talk to this handsome, stunning man. But now he's an alien, too? This is dope! Like, how can I go, how can this adventure go wrong? Well, (laughs) Vincent's going to do his best to make sure that it goes wrong because he goes, tell you what, I'll pay for the water. Why don't you come home with me? Why don't you come home with me and whatever happens, happens. (laughs) The guy, the alien's like, what? He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, that was Freudian slip. You come home with me since you're an alien 
and you don't know what to do in Brussels, come on with me. I got a wife and a little kid. <laughs> this is a recipe for disaster, right? And also, budding serial killers out there, if you are extremely handsome, this trick might work for you. Just sit in a bar, wait till someone to invite you to their house. This is how horror movies start off. But, and this one might end in a horror movie. I haven't gotten to the ending yet. He tells the guy, why don't you come back to my house? You can stay in my house. Come back to my house. So the gentleman does. Vincent is very nice. He pays for the water. What type of backward country (laughs) makes you buy a glass of water? They go to Vincent's house. And this dude's chilling at the pad for a while. This alien dude, this super handsome dude, is hanging out with Vincent and his family. Gets to meet his wife. Gets to meet his little girl. Stays there a couple days. Now, Vincent approaches a group called Sobeps. It's a Belgium UFO group. It's like the society of a bunch of Belgium terms meaning UFO. And he goes to the group and he goes, hey guys, guys, guess what? We're not going to guess. We're actually not going to guess. Just tell us. And he goes, okay, I got an alien at my house. I met this really attractive man at a bar and everyone's kind of like, oh, where's this story going? He's like, no, no, it's not like that. Why does everyone think it's like that? And I brought him back to my house and he's an alien. He's from outer space. I would like to bring him to you guys so you guys can like interview him because you're into UFOs, right? That's what this whole group's about. Now, the group declines. They say, no, we'd rather not meet this guy. Let's put a little let's put a little feather in that part for right now. So Vincent goes back to feed, and he's like, oh, well, it's their loss, right? I happen to have the cutest alien in this quadrant living in my house. If they don't want to meet him, that just means more alien goodness for me. But Vincent also, you know, has to work and stuff like that. In between hanging out with his new alien pal, drinking at the bar... And, you know, sleeping. He also has to work. One day, he comes home from work. He's like, alien, honey. In that order, right? (laughs) Because he likes the alien guy a lot better. Hey, guys, where are you? House is empty. Huh? Hey, alien, honey. Then he hears. Okay, that sounded like a drum line. It was supposed to be a little girl running through the house. And he's like, daughter, who we never named. And she's like, daddy, daddy, I'm so glad you're home. He's like pushing her out of the way. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But where's my alien buddy? He left with this dude's wife. And neither of them were ever seen again. He was stuck or maybe he liked his daughter. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he's like, oh, man, you left me the daughter. Black. Much rather you left me the alien and the wife and the daughter left. He ends up being left alone with his daughter, and neither of these people, the alien or the wife, are ever seen again. Serial killer who's super selective, and he basically that's his MO. He has to be invited in your house like a vampire and stay a couple days and get invited to a UFO seminar where they turn him down. And then he's like, now it's my time to strike. This is what my plan has always been. This is my bizarro fetish. Actual alien who absconded with this poor man's wife, this wife left him, for this stunning, super hot dude who happened to be an alien. Or maybe it was just some really hot guy who went home with this other dude and was pulling some sort of scam and just left with this dude's wife. What's interesting is, I read that story, the whole story is fascinating to me, but I read that story and got it from thinkaboutitdocs.com. And I thought, the weirdest part, the whole story is bizarre, right? First off, I didn't know they sold beer at cafes. So, I mean, <laughs> just from the very first sentence, I was like, huh? What wacky alternate universe does this story take place in? Guys drinking beer in a cafe. The whole story is weird. But the one thing that stuck out to me was the UFO organization turning down the possible visit from an alien. Because let's be frank. Let's be frank here for a second. UFO organizations have a great mix of, let's say, 90% people who are really smart and dedicated to the research of these topics, and then 10% crackpots. I'd actually even give it more like maybe 2% crackpots. And you have people who are really dedicated to doing what they're doing. It's something that they're really engaged in. It can be, it's the same way people are passionate about model trains. Like, I'm sure the model train community... Every so often, some weirdo joins who likes crashing them. Hey, guys, you know it would be really cool if we, like, put this little person on the train track and then watch what happens. They're like, no, we're not going to do that tonight. And come back to our place later and we'll do that. I'm sure there's a 2% weirdos in every subculture. But 
The UFO community declined to meet it. So I actually tracked down this UFO community. They're no longer SOPEPs. Now they're COBEPs. They changed from the society to the committee. A lot of the same members, but they said, we just kind of changed the way things are organized. After the internet came out, we stopped publishing books and doing newsletters. We figured we'd change the name to give it a different feeling. So I tracked these guys down, and I emailed them at like midnight last night, right before I went to bed. I go, I wonder if these guys are still around. That's so bizarre that they would turn down this story. And I emailed them. I said, hey, you know, I got this podcast. Here is the full text that I read. I sent them the thinkaboutitdocs.com link and the, the short paragraph that this story is based on. I go, do you know anything about this? And this was the reason. I got a response within hours. I mean, again, midnight in America on the West Coast is like Tuesday, January 14th in Belgium. But I got a response super fast. Let me read it to you. I've heard about that story. This man, the witness, is slash was a strange person without credibility. This person was well known from the former Sobeps for a lot of reasons. Unquote. That actually makes it more mysterious, dude. Now I'm even more curious, but I'm not going to pester these guys, right? Like, I just emailed them back saying, thank you for the quick response. Have a great day. That makes it... I want to know that story now. But again, I appreciated that they responded so quickly. They obviously don't want to talk about it because they could have sent me a bunch of, like, articles. Local pest, once again, arrested at cafe trying to pay for people's water. And then the subheadline goes, water is free, says local constable. I don't know what what was going on, but apparently when this guy walked in and said, hey, I have an alien in my house, they knew his reputation. And they're like, no, no thanks. We know you're the guy who puts the little dude on the train track. So the, the story's even more mysterious at this point. Like That explanation actually piqued my interest more. Is he still around? Is Vincent, who's not his real name, I'm just guessing, but... Is he still around? Is he still bringing handsome men back to his house, hoping they're aliens too? He's like, maybe if I crack this one's head open, green goo will come out. Who knows? Who knows? Is the story real? And I don't know. I don't know. They're basically, Kobeps was like, no, this guy's, this guy, uh uh-uh. I'm putting words in their mouth, but this guy is, cool, 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 do, 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 do. He's typing in sound effects. He has GIFs in the email of cuckoo clocks going off. He didn't do any of that. But... That was me putting words into their mouth, or gifts into their email. Is the story real? Basically, they're saying no. This guy was has no credibility. Has no credibility at all. But an interesting story nonetheless. The moral of the story is don't invite strangers home. Anybody. Whether it's on Tinder, or Grinder or Farmers Only, or Plenty of Fish, or at a cafe. Don't bring them home, especially if you have other family members, i.e. other victims for the serial killer. Just don't bring people home. That's the moral of the story, really, right? And I know a lot of you guys are young, you're out dating and stuff like that. I, I, actually, I bring people home all the time, but but I have a really good sense. I can tell, one, whether or not they're capable of sticking a knife in my neck. That's usually the first thing when I'm talking to someone. Talk, well, all the bars are closed now, but you're talking to a girl, you think... Could this woman put a knife in my neck? I literally, I literally have to process that. And if the answer, I'm not talking physically, because anyone can grab a knife and put it in your neck, but you're talking to someone, you're like, is this person capable of putting a knife in my neck? Because I've been around people who are actually capable of that, so you can kind of tell, you can kind of suss it out. This guy obviously didn't have that thing, right? Because this dude did end up taking his wife. But again, I don't know if he was just really lonely and wanted an alien pal, if he just wanted to make a story up. Who knows? But... Moral of the story, don't bring people home, especially don't bring people home to your house where your significant other is if they are radically more beautiful than you are (laughs) and have a UFO, right? Because even if they're uglier than you and they have like a really nice ride, i.e. something capable of warp drive, your your wife's probably going to leave you. (laughs) Your wife is probably going to leave you for the man with warp drive. Doesn't matter how many tentacles he has. If he's capable of hitting Mach 10,000, don't bring them home. Don't bring them home. Don't let them anywhere near your wife. See, Knowles, let's go ahead and hop in that carpenter copter. We're going to take off. We're going to start flying through the sky. And as we're doing that, I'm going to do another real quick Dead Rabbit Recommends. I just did one yesterday, too. But this one is from someone who listens to the show, a listener of the show. His name is John Sharon, and he's an animator. 
And I'm going to post in the show notes one of his, uh, it was actually his like thesis film. It's a short animated film called uh, Sackhead Strikes Out. Short animated cartoon would probably be the term. Head. Sackhead Strikes Out. It's awesome. He sent me, he wanted to, he wanted to work with me on something. So I was looking through his portfolio and he just does this amazing animation. I'm always so impressed by what you guys are capable of doing. From Ash Black's just original Dead Rabbit logo. We, we had Ashley, we had John, we had Grant. We had Robert Paulson doing all this great artwork. Paul Lee sent me stuff. I just got something from location the other day. We have all this amazing artwork coming in. But you guys can actually, ch- and I appreciate all of that, guys. And whoever I missed, I apologize for that. But you can check out John Sharon's thesis cartoon. It's really dope. It's really weird. It's, it's, it's creepy. It's funny. I said I compared it to Ren and Stimpy and David Lynch. It's really dope. Check it out. It's really, really kind of unsettling cartoon. So if you're into the paranormal because you're listening to the show, check out Sackhead Strikes Out. It'll be in the links below. See, Knowles is trying to watch the cartoon. We're all watching it on little DVD players. Like, can I watch? Can I watch the helicopters swerving from side to side? You can watch it, bro, when you land the helicopter. First, we got to get there safe and sound. We are headed out to the Hamar Dabin Mountain Range. <laughs> The Hamar Dabin Mountain Range is in southern Siberia. As we're flying over, we notice the snowstorm is getting exceptionally bad, even for Siberia. It's August 2nd, 1993. Now, I got so much of my research from a Reddit user named GD Maria. I had actually never heard of this story, and part of me thought it was fake until I started going through their sources, and I go, oh, this is... This is real, and I've never heard of this before. It's super obscure because a lot of the sources aren't in English. So thank you so much, GD Maria, for compiling all of this stuff. Now, most of us, if not all of us, are aware of the Dyatlov Pass incident. In 1959, February 1st to the 2nd, 1959, in the Ural Mountains, on Dyatlov Pass, nine experienced hikers perished. The official report says six died of hypothermia, Three died of physical trauma caused by a, quote, unknown compelling force. And there's been movies made on it. There was a great movie called Devil's Pass. Very, very good movie about the Olaf Pass. Very, very good movie. Check that out. That's a super common top iceberg conspiracy theory. The question is, what happened? Some people say it was like UFOs. Some people say it was the government, the the Soviet government. They'd, They'd wandered into the wrong area. Some people say that a bomb was dropped. They were testing explosives, and that's what killed these people. All sorts of theories. It's a very, very fascinating story. I covered a story last year about the Yuba County Five. Something similar happened in America, in Yuba County, and I think it was in California. Five men on their way to a basketball game disappeared in a snowstorm. And the mystery was one of them was found in a trailer surrounded by food and water. It was like a survivalist trailer, like an outlook station or something like that. He died, never opened a can of food, and they said he'd been there for months. So we have the Dyatlov Pass. It's a super famous story. Yuba County 5 is starting to become famous. But I've never heard of this story. 1,800 miles away from Dyatlov Pass is the Hamar Dabin Mountain Range. On August 2nd, 1993, Lidmilia Korovina, she's a 41-year-old woman. She's the leader of this hiking expedition, experienced hiker. Her daughter is actually running a second hiking expedition. She's like 17, 18. On another part of the mountain, they're going to meet up in this valley. These people are not amateurs at this. They've been doing this all their life. A little toddler. A little toddler comes out of the womb on a mountain slope, and then the mom is at the top, and she goes, come to your milk, and the baby has to climb up the mountain. Experienced hikers. So Ludmilia has a team of six people. They're going to go up the Hamar Dabin Pass. First day is going pretty well. I mean, the weather sucks, but what do you expect you in the middle of Siberia? And this was the rest of her team. You had Sasha, a 23-year-old male, Longtime family friend of Lidmilia, who I will mispronounce her name differently each time. Let's call her Linda. No disrespect. But let's call her Linda just so I'm not stumbling over it all the time. So Sasha is 23 years old, a longtime family member. You had Tatiana, 24 years old. You had Denise, 19. Vika, 16 year old girl. Timur, 15 year old. And Valia, 17 years old. So it's a young group. 
led by an experienced hiker. And even the youngsters, after this is all said and done, they go, these people were, this was not a bunch of people coming from Brussels, Belgium to spend the weekend backpacking. These were experienced local hikers. So even though they were young, they knew what they were doing. August 4th, they come to a slope on the mountain. When people are trying to put this story together, this is one of the first things that don't make sense. Because this slope has no natural cover. And they decide to make camp there. And people have gone, that's a weird place for a bunch of experienced hikers to make camp. You figured they'd want to have some sort of shelter. But for whatever reason, that is where Lydia decides to build that base camp that night. That night... While they're nestled in as best as they can, a massive thunderstorm (laughs) hits the area. They wake up August 5th. I don't think they got any sleep that night. Could you sleep when you're on a mountain, a massive thunderstorm going on? They wake up, quote unquote, August 5th, weather's terrible. There's first off, fresh snow everywhere. It's the the weather itself is bad. They go, we got to get down this mountain. Like, we, that's, that was the point to begin with, was to go up the mountain and then come down. But we should probably pick up the pace, because this weather's only going to get worse. They're making their way down the mountain. And all of a sudden, Sasha wipes his nose. Sees a bit of blood on his glove. Wipes some more blood away from his nose. What? These conditions aren't hospitable to human life. So you're, you're going to be, be expected to get a little bit of ear ring in your ears pop. Your nose gets bloody because it's dry and stuff like that. But it's pouring out of his nose at this point. And Sasha's actually wiping it and he's moving his hand away. And as he moves it away, blood is no longer just trickling out. It's leaking out of his nose onto his glove, onto the snow. The whole hiking group turns around and Sasha's standing there. He opens his mouth up. Blood is pouring out of his mouth. He falls to the ground, bleeding profusely from the nose and the mouth. Lydia has to make a decision right now. She is the leader of the group. But Sasha was someone she basically raised. She was a close member of the family. She viewed him as her son. She falls down in front of the body. She figures she's going to make a risk. A stupid risk, but she makes this decision. She tells the others, go on without me. Send back help. The others kind of turn and they kind of look at the situation. It's shocking. They're terrified. But they all know Sasha's dead. The amount of blood that's coming out of them, there's no way they can get back to civilization in time. They're watching Lydia cradle the body of Sasha. She won't. Let him die alone. They start heading down the pass. They don't get far, though, when they hear Lydia herself begin to scream. Because when they turn and head back to see what's happening, by the time they get there, Lydia's mouth is wide open. Blood is pouring out. Denise is looking at the situation. (laughs) He sees a drop of blood on the snow in front of him. Then another one hesitantly reaches his gloved hand up to his nose. He's bleeding. Everyone at this point is having trickles of blood come out of their nose. Valya, the 17-year-old girl, looks and she sees Vika and Tatiana begin tearing at their clothes. Grabbing handfuls of jackets, of shirts, of sweaters, and just trying to tear them off of their body. Vika falls to the ground, writhing in pain, twitching. Tatiana falls as well. Denise runs and hides behind a rock. What else are you going to do? Even though the assailant is unseen, you're just trying to get some sort of protection. Tatiana begins to turn and crawl through the snow to a pile of rocks that are visible through the powder. She begins smashing her head into the rocks. Valya, seeing that, going, I can't go over there, because that's weird. She runs over to Vika, the other girl who's still twitching in the snow. Vika, Vika, we have to get out of here. 
Vika looks at Valya and then bites her. Valya pulls away. She sees Teemer going in what is only described as going mad. Everyone in this group is affected, but Denis and Valya seem to be holding out just a little bit longer. Valya and Denis meet up and they start heading down the mountain, leaving everyone behind. There's nothing you can do for these people. They don't get very far down when both of them start to complain that things are getting too hazy. They're having a hard time seeing. They're having a hard time thinking. Denise goes, listen, Valia, you have to run. You have to make a run for it. Your backpack's too heavy. Drop it. Take everything essential out that you need. And then you run down the mountain. Valia just nods her head. She takes her backpack off. She opens it up. She begins going through it. After she's grabbed a few things, she hears... She looks up from her backpack. Blood is pouring out of Denise's mouth. She doesn't even look back. She runs down that mountain, barely conscious. Barely able to think of her next step. But she gets down that mountain. Night falls. She's alone in the forest. She is alone. For three days, wandering through the area until she is finally rescued. And at first, she says nothing. The rescuers go, what what happened? Where's everyone else? She says nothing. She offers no details. She responds to no questions. They do end up locating the location of these bodies. But it's not until the end of August when they can actually retrieve them because the weather is so bad. And when the rescue team get rescue team, body retrieval team, really, at this point, gets there, they notice that some of the bodies are huddled together in a final moment of comfort. Others are just splayed out, laying there, alone in the melting snow. The rescue team said that all their eyes were gone. There were worms crawling out of their mouths. Now, that's not supernatural, right? It's creepy and disgusting. That's not supernatural. It's scavengers. Scavengers are always going to go for soft tissue, which is your butthole and your eyeballs. The autopsy that was done on these bodies, they said the cause of death. The cause of death was actually hypothermia. They also said that these bodies all seemed to show some sort of protein deficiency. And they had bruising of the lungs. There's a memorial placed for these hikers in the area. And that's it. The story that we know is from Valya telling people over time. The story has been pieced together by accounts that friends have come forward and said, you know, a couple months later, Valya told me this. Someone else to say a couple months later, a couple years later, Valya told me this. Her story, the story has been pieced together. So there are pieces of it that are contradictory. Which is interesting. Uh, One of the versions is when she runs down the mountain, she then goes back up the mountain and sees everyone is dead, confirms they're dead, and then goes back and is lost for three days. One of them is when she goes back up the mountain, not everyone's dead, that um, Lydia, who I hate that I couldn't pronounce her name, but that the hiking commander was still alive and she gave her instructions on how to get out. People have thought that's probably not true. That part of the story is not true. These people, though, really did die. Apparently, it's really interesting because it's one of those stories that's so shocking. The fact that I hadn't heard of it started making me think, is this like viral marketing for a movie or something like that? It wasn't until I started going through the links and I go, oh, this seems to be real. This seems to be a real event. This seems to be real people that were impacted by this. That There are articles, you know, five years later saying, looking back on this and looking back on this tragic event. It's A very fascinating story because it's basically Dyatlov Pass with the survivor. But even with a witness there, we're no closer to what happened. There was a Reddit user who goes by the name Not S. Holmes, who actually gave their theory, and it's a theory that I've used for other stuff on the show as well. Hydrogen sulfide. It's a chemical, it smells like sulfur, that if you get enough of it over a short amount of time, it can kill you. And if it doesn't kill you, it can make you hallucinate. It can definitely irritate your nose and your lungs. And there was actually a paper mill in the area that got cited 
for polluting the water supply. And one of the things it was polluting it with was hydrogen sulfide. So is it possible that this pollutant got into the snowpack and then being in that area overnight, they were getting slow doses of it, or there was a massive dose at one point? Who knows? But to make this even more of a mystery, And to intrigue you long-time listeners or you 100% completionists of Dead Rabbit Radio. This mountain range has also had UFO sightings, Bigfoot sightings. And right next to this area, right next to this area where that paper mill is situated, is Lake Baikal, which is a place that we've done Quite a few episodes early on the run of this show. Lake Baikal is basically Soviet Union's Bermuda Triangle slash Area 51. There's long been rumors of an underwater alien base there. I think the location of these two things is not coincidental. Lake Baikal is full of rumors. And this story is true. It's very, very interesting because whenever we look at cases like Yuba County 5 or Dyatlov Pass or any missing person story, you always want to have a witness. You always want to have someone who can come back and tell the story. Someone who got away from Dublin, Wisconsin. Someone who moved out the day the Bell Ray surge happened. But we don't. We don't have these witnesses. This story, we have a witness, someone who was there, who saw the unknown compelling force in action. And we are no closer to solving that mystery. Fascinating story. Fascinating story. And it just reminds us that you could literally be standing there watching something completely unknown happen to your friends, to your family. You could be the lone survivor of this bizarre interaction. And even then, in the end, you still don't know what happened. The famous saying is, the truth is out there. But does that even matter if you can see the truth while it's happening and still not know what the answers are? DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Stop.